I actually, well, I think it's, I think it's important because I think that it would be, I think that the argument. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields on the program. Uh, today we have Veronica, uh, Veronica Peterson, who is a, a free speech advocate for Students for Liberty. Also, we have David Lee. Uh, he's the secretary of the Placer County Libertarian Party and uh, John Cameron, Develop development officer of Pacific Legal Foundation and the author of Rewire and Rekill. Uh, Veronica, tell us what, uh, what Speak Freely is all about. So it's a program from, uh, through Students for Liberty, which is the largest uh, student libertarian organization mm -hmm. in the world. Um, and what they're doing is they, um, they have campus coordinators to work with college campuses to get speakers um, and raise awareness for free speech issues. Um, we were in um, Berkeley uh, recently. Um, and we were actually protesting, or not protesting, demonstrating for jury nullification um, because it's a free speech issue that um, is very similar to the um, the events that have taken place at Berkeley. Um, the, like Milo and the young Coulter, they were um, canceled due to safety reasons. And so what's happening to jury nullification advocates is courts have made buffer zones around the courthouse and said, you can't demonstrate here because safety. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, we we've, we've did was um, went to the Berkeley campus and um, basically had like a talking point for, um, you know, these types of free speech speech issues. So. Well, tell us just a quick background. What is jury nullification? What, is, what does it entail and how does it work? So um, basically, it's, it's a right that you have as a juror. Um, if you believe that a law is not just or, you know, I mean, I, I think it doesn't really matter what exactly your feelings are, but if for some reason you don't believe in this law, you have the right to nullify the jury. Um, and I don't know all the details about it. Um, maybe somebody well, here. The, the history of jury nullification was actually to protect people from uh, 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 political, becoming political prisoners because they fell out of favor with the people in power. And so that was originally how it got started with the, the jury was to protect people from becoming political prisoners. So if, if, if a jury of your peers and you were convicted of a crime like say, uh, hate speech, and uh, even though there was a law against hate speech, you would be uh, just one juror, because you have to have a, a, a unanimous decision to go to prison or to be convicted or guilty. Uh, it allows a citizen to be able to nullify the jury by saying not guilty, even though it is technically against the law to do that. So Really nullify the law. And that's it, yeah, basically it, right. it allows a citizen to nullify the law. And I, and I tell people, all the time that if you get a chance to serve on a jury, you should do that because that is when a citizen is his most powerful person. So if somebody's in a um, in, in going up for a marijuana possession of marijuana, even though it's against the law to have marijuana or federal law, if you're on a jury, you can nullify that law because you feel that it's unjust. So when you're on a jury, that's when you're at your most powerful as as an individual citizen. And yep. it's, a, it's such ahead. an important free speech issue, too, because the courts don't want jurors to know that they have this right. And so courts are really going out of their way to <clears throat> shut people down, um, especially around courthouses or where people, you know, might be on a jury anytime soon. Yeah, up until the turn of the 19th or the 19th to the 20th century, uh, uh, jurors were instructed that you have the right to judge the facts in the case and the law in right. the case. Right. Yeah. And so now and, uh, and people are getting arrested for trying to tell them. Well, yes. Yeah, uh, at about the same time that uh, uh, drug laws were getting enacted and other uh, prohibition laws and other unpopular laws were getting uh, passed due to fear tactics and whatnot, uh, jurors uh, or judges began saying, you only have the right to judge the facts in the case. I will be the judge of the law. You can only judge the facts, and if the facts uh, point to, to a guilty verdict under the law, you must vote uh, guilty. That's essentially what uh, what judges now uh, tell jurors. And now, uh, uh, some people, uh, uh, Honey Lanham and her husband, and a few other people, put together the jury uh, FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury Association, uh, back in the I think back in the 90s or 80s, something like that, and uh, made a movement out of it. Put together uh, flyers and leaflets and so forth, and uh, started. Uh, 
distributing those nationwide. And so what's happening now is people who are Fiji activists are picketing courthouses uh, when there's a, a particularly odious uh, trial going on for, say, drug possession in, in, the, at, at a, in the federal court, that kind of thing. Uh, a law which nobody likes, or very few people like, but still it's on the books and still being prosecuted. So a, a juror can say, uh, you know, so people are, you know, are handing out the leaflets to uh, the potential jury pool, and the judges don't like that a bit. And so it turns into a free speech issue saying, uh, you know, it's jury tampering. People have actually gotten arrested for jury tampering. And charged with felonies. Yeah, charged with felony jury tampering. When by, in reality, it's, it's uh, judicial speech. overreach by the judge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a free speech <laughs> issue. It's First Amendment protected speech. Yeah. And I, you know, I shouldn't tell any people this, but if you want to get, if you if you want to make sure that you don't get on a jury, all you have to say is, I believe I have the right to judge the law as well as the facts. You'll be oh, off yeah. the jury in a yeah. nanosecond. Yeah. So, but uh, what you need to do if you want to, you know, if you want to nullify a bad law and you're in the jury pool, is say nothing and get on the jury and uh, vote your conscience, which is to nullify that really horrendous bad law by hanging the jury. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. I thought that that um, a citizen's ability to judge the law was part of the law. It was actually stated in law, and then it people, have, people have made. Uh, either pass laws that that uh, I understood that that it's been legislated out of existence. I don't know in it's some been areas. Legislated. Is that true? Does anybody? I'm not know sure it's that? been legislated out of, out of existence, but certainly the judiciary has started has changed the jury instructions mm -hmm. to make it sound like it's illegal to hang a jury uh, if you uh, don't like the law. So judges are lying to people. Uh, well, they're uh, misleading. I think. Oh. So. I'm shocked by that. <laughs> so how was the uh, uh, experience that, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, two diametrically opposed camps uh, demonstrating at Berkeley. One camp, the liberals uh, saying that uh, Ann Coulter should be, and, and what's his name, uh, the other Milo. guy? Milo. Milo should be persona non grata, shouldn't be allowed within the city limits because they're hateful, terrible, very bad people. And then, uh, you know, and, and basically denying them their, you know, supporting the university and denying them their free speech rights. You've got another camp, uh, which is uh, Trump supporters and uh, other people who kind of like the First Amendment and kind of like free speech. Uh, they're, they're separated by about 10 blocks, but they're, they're both, on, both uh, in Berkeley. How did it work out? Did they, was, was there armed warfare or anything? So that day, um, it was peaceful. Um, towards the end, um, there, when one camp dispersed, um, they kind of had to walk past the other, the other camp. Um, the police presence, though, was unreal. Um, Tell so, us about that police presence. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> On campus, um, I, when, I, when I, I walked up from BERT, um, about two blocks from campus, I probably passed 30 cops. Um, as I walked across campus, there was two helicopters, um, and I was just Black thinking... helicopters, right? I actually don't know, um, <laughs> um, but I was thinking, I don't know how students go to school here. Um, I mean, the, it, the tension was just thick, and then you got over to Sproul Hall, and I think there was at least 100 police officers in riot gear, um, and, um, you know, kind of everywhere um, throughout town, there was just... Police How did that compare everywhere. to the number of demonstrators? So I don't know. I think that the demonstrators were scattered around at different places and different mm -hmm. times. The uh, the I don't the anti-fascists didn't end up showing up. Um, in the sense, I think I don't know really what that means, but there was no big violent. Well, the, the, the speech by that time had been canceled, so the anti right. people probably were not as motivated as, as they would have been. Otherwise. Right, there was still definitely a group um, of people that were really raising the issue. Like their position was clearly, this isn't a free speech issue. This is about fascism, um, you know. And as a as a free speech advocate, um, it can be about both. Um, I think that that's really important to keep in we mind. We need to let fascists say their thing so that we can discredit them with their own words. I saw there was a video or like a news broadcast afterwards and there was this lady and she was just sitting on the bench and, you know, she was saying, you know, I think everybody should be able to, um, you know, be able to say what they think and really it just sorts it all out for us, right? Like the people who are saying dumb things are, 
you know, exposing themselves and saves us the hassle. The um, antidote for bad speech is more speech. Yeah. Um, John, there was a peer-reviewed publication. This is right up your alley. A peer-reviewed publication in uh, the magazine or the, the or in the publication, Organization Studies. They did a survey. They found that only 36% of geoscientists and engineers buy into global warming as a crisis. Now, they, a lot of them said that it exists or whatever, but only 36% said it was something we need to worry about. Uh, another survey showed that only 30% of meteorologists, that's the weathermen, uh, are worried about uh, uh, global warming, according to a survey by the primary meteorological society, the American Meteorological Society, uh, only 89% uh, say it's a thing, but only 30% only say it's uh, actually uh, a, a serious thing. Does this mean that there's now a consensus on global warming? Um, it's, the science is settled. The science <laughs> is settled. It, it's strange. I've always found this, this really strange that uh, the, this one study that everybody quotes that 97% of climate scientists are in agreement that global warming is caused by... Um, if you ever look at how that survey was derived, in essence, they... They chose a group of papers that supported um, the viewpoint, and then only 97% of the 100% of pre-selected actually uh, agreed with the fact that they'd stated in their papers that it. But they they chose people who who believed in the whole um, you know man-made global warming, and and cherry picked it. And if you um, I like Wikipedia, but even if you look at the Wikipedia article on it, they've cherry-picked surveys that that uh, show it. Um, and I've seen some other surveys that I thought were pretty well done when I looked at the methodology. Well, the, the surveys I'm quoting here were, yeah. were quoted in Forbes, which is yeah. not exactly an, an alt no, news I'm, publication. I'm, um, I would say this is uh, probably actually conservative about the dissent uh, toward the whole idea of global warming being a crisis. If you want to see a real crisis, uh, look at what's going to happen if there's a little ice age. I mean, it's awfully hard to grow crops under a glacier. So, um, you know, global warming, there's there's a number of really good studies out there, there that say a little bit of warming of the Earth's temperature will create more area for crops and actually be beneficial. There's been no uh, credible evidence stating that sea levels are rising. There are some places that are sinking. Um, you know, like here in the Central Valley, we have a water table that's sunk in some places or, or surfaced by a foot, foot and a half because people have been pumping a lot of water. But as that water seeps back in, the land will rise. So um, I was just talking to a, a donor the other day that says that uh, one of his best friends lives on an island in uh, Washington. And they have an ocean, in essence, ocean front view. And there has been no change whatsoever in the 50 years that they've lived there in the level of the sea. So um, I would say this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a, there's a wonderful organization called the, the PetitionProject.org that the, uh, the uh, people who are, are religious about global warming try to discredit by signing up you know, Daffy Duck and Goofy and people like that that has, I think, 50,000 um, signatures on it. And these are people who all have hard science degrees, so they know how to do statistics. They have either a bachelor's, master's, or PhD. And they have um, a real nice uh, formula that's actually predictive for temperature changes. And it has completely and totally, well, you know about correlation and causation. Um, you know, causation says, if this happens, then that. And none of the global warming advocates have ever been able to uh, have um, create a, a formula. They have plenty of models, but a formula that's predictive. You know, you put in this much carbon dioxide, you get this much temperature change out. And their excuse is always, well, th there's too many variables and it's too complex a system. Yet their models predict it, but they can never, um, their models predict behavior, but they can never take that model and cause it to come uh, to actually predict future temperature rise. Whereas the, the formula that the petitionproject.org has is an accurate predictor. It's based completely and totally on uh, solar flare activity or sunspot activity and the level of intensity of solar radiation. And people who look at that now uh, are predicting that we're going into 
something very similar to the Maunder Minimum, which happened during the Little Ice Age when major rivers around the world, the Thames and the Danube and I think the Delta, whatever Washington had to cross, um, froze solid. And so they're, they're predicting that the next 30 to 50 years is going to be one of those cycles rather than this global warming. So, yeah. but, 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 but yet, the major media, the uh, uh, academia, uh, still uh, buy into the whole well, idea. I, I think it's almost, a it's almost like scientists have become religion, uh, becoming religion or, or mm -hmm. putting forth a religion when science is, is always skeptical. I mean, true science should always be wanting to test things and add more uh, variables into the situation to test it further. Test uh, it. You know, so you get a and, model. And you should always be skeptical, though, of anything that's the so-called law of physics now, or I law could, of chemistry. I could, you know, create um, a perfect model that predicts that Scarlett Johansson should fall madly in love with me. But <laughs> reality enters into this model, and it never pans out. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> but the global uh, warming folks have these models, and they talk about the models, and if this happens, then that. This could happen. Scientists predict this will happen. But nobody says our formula has accurately predicted in the past, due to a change in CO2 levels in the atmosphere, a resulting later increase in temperature. There is nothing <coughs> out there like that. Well, so, human beings well, throughout I, I, this. I have a more, I have a more cynical uh, uh, opinion about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think that the people who are talking the global warming game as a, and basically fear mongering it mm -hmm. are doing it because they know that's the only way they're going to get government grants for their research project projects. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that government uh, entities are so involved and so uh, dedicated to the idea of global warming is because it's a, it's a lever of power. If they can dictate what the, uh, uh, the entire energy producing industry does, mm -hmm. they've got control over a huge percentage of the economy and control is what politicians are looking for because it gives them a tax base, um, more, you know, an excuse to tax, an excuse to regulate, an excuse to essentially push people around and, uh, and do whatever they want. And, and, and you know, tread on a little guy. That I think is what really is going on. I'll, it's, I'll it's take it a, excuse, I'll, I'll it's take an it a step. For bureaucrats and politicians yeah. to uh, have their way. I would uh, be really yeah. happy if government funding went to replicate studies <clears throat> um, instead of just further, you know, just dumping more money into studies that haven't shown to be um, repeatable. Um, I think that would be a really useful. Um, I, I think it would be really. Um, responsible thing to do before we dump, you know, millions of dollars into. Well, we're we're spending now. Basically, we're taking the economy and completely distorting it, and using tax codes to promote certain quote unquote green energy. And you know, I'm I'm upset about it for that reason. But what really upsets me is the the statement they make that this science is settled. Uh, so no, science is never settled. Science is most. Uh, let's That's just look at point. let's just look at health. Uh, let's just talk about uh, health. Uh, how long ago, a few years ago, dietary cholesterol was supposed to lead to increases in blood cholesterol level heart disease? Oh, now, totally discredited. Now, that's completely discredited. Um, the, uh, 30 years ago, um, 35 years ago, just and this is medical science. This is medical science that, that has been... Uh, you know, billions of dollars, lives dependent on and all the rest of that. 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when people had stomach ulcers, there were operations they'd take out part of their stomach. And then a scientist in Australia uh, found a certain bacteria that was always present in all the cultures he ran for people with ulcers. He could get nobody to, to pay attention to his studies. Uh, so he ingested this bacteria himself, developed an ulcer, and then took an antibiotic killed the bacteria, the ulcer went away. So we ask ourselves a question, why would nobody look at these studies? And this feeds to Richard's point, because it was a billion dollar a year minimum industry cutting people open and taking out half their stomach. And if antibiotics, a simple injection or a pill, could cure this, then all of that revenue stream went away. And the same thing is happening with this. And, and my last can, note yeah, on this is that, um, Wind turbines kill hundreds of thousands of raptors a year. And I like hawks and eagles. And, and why are the birders not up in arms over that destruction? If you try to put a cold 
fired power plant up and it killed one eagle, there would be a lawsuit to stop it deadly in its tracks, stop it in its tracks. But because it's green and it's part of their religion, they're they're turning a blind eye to the destruction of a huge part of the bird population. Yeah, so and, that and, just and, makes and the, me sick. Yeah, the, the whole idea that you can trust authority to get it right has been wrong since the Middle Ages and before. In, during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was the scientific authority uh, because they said they were, and they uh, said that uh, if you uh, bleed people, that will cure them of the of the evil spirits that uh, are making them sick. And you know, it goes on and on and on. And the persecution the, the, of Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, the earth is flat, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, I mean, you know, science as if, you know, anytime somebody says the science is settled, mm -hmm. this has been decided, you are a fool and illiterate and stupid to even question it, question them. So you like the science guy? <laughs> Bill Nye. Bill, Bill Nye, the quasi-science guy. Needs, yeah. to be, needs to be questioned first and foremost. Yeah, maybe bleeding, no, I can't say that. A hotel industry nonprofit uh, hired a New York actress to play the part of a person who was upset because her neighborhood was, invo was uh, invaded by Airbnb. <gasps> Strangers were coming to the neighborhood and upsetting the r urban community. But it was an actress playing a part of a concerned citizen. What does that tell you, Veronica, about the... Uh, the uh, the lobbying power of the hotel industry it's just really frustrating um you know i mean somebody we we really do appeal to these personal stories they're important to us we care about other people and so when we see somebody on tv you know you you want to trust them and you want to empathize with them and you you do want you want to be taken seriously and so you take them seriously and then when a hotel lobby with the finances and resources to put this out there, um, it's, I think it's really dirty and it's really frustrating because how can you really compete with that? Um, this, this is fake news. It's the definition of dirty tricks. Yeah, well, I mean. I, the, the way you compete with it is what happened. A neighborhood or a, a, a resident, an actual resident of Anacostia. Hopefully, right? Uh, I think yeah, it no, was. An, but... an actual resident of Anacostia said, I don't know that person. I like Airbnb. It brings in a nicer class of people. Yeah. It brings in, you know, money from tourism. This has, you know, has helped our neighborhood tremendously. Right. This uh, is it why... hasn't helped Hilton. It hasn't helped Ramada Inn, but it sure helped our neighborhood, and I like it. Right. I mean, and this... I don't think she's a real person, and she figured out that she was an actress from New York. I know. It's it's amazing that that happened. Um, I I really. Um, um, just lost my train it's a, of it's thought. A, well, it's, um. a private, it's a private property issue in a way. Cause, oh, of course it is. Because Airbnb is, is quintessential. It's your house, just like in uh, Uber, it's your car. You can do what you want. If you want to share your house, you want to share your car, that's that's a right of property, a right of freedom. You know, so that... that uh, or should be. It's just another example, because yeah. I was in Las Vegas when the uh, taxi cab drivers were, were striking against Uber. They were, they were doing a... a like a three-hour strike or something in, in Las Vegas, and, uh, and they were uh, they were like blocking hotels and and doing all kinds of dirty tricks to yeah. try to uh, get get the city council to pass a, a law against Uber. Yeah, yeah I think this is uh, like the prime example of fake news, though, uh, <laughs> because you really don't know who you can trust. It, it creates just this little loop, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just a distrust, and it's. It's sad, um, and I really, um, you know, I, I think that we do want to help communities thrive. Um, and I'm glad to see that this is a community that people feel that they know each other well enough to say, "Hey, you, you're not part of this community. Where, where did you come from?" Um, you know, so um, that's that's a really hard thing, and I think it's really just a, a nasty thing for the hotel lobby to do. Yeah, it skirts the fine line of fraud. Probably. Well. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, another, uh, I guess you'd call the, well, the regulatory overreach story, Mats Jarlstrom. Uh, he, he's from Sweden originally, he has a, an engineering degree of some sort or another. His wife got uh, uh, tagged by a red light camera. And he or she uh, thought that, you know, I thought that light was yellow. What's going on? How come I got my picture taken as, as you know, by this red light thing and got mailed a, you know, a multi, uh, you know, three-figure fine. 
So he decided to do a little bit of math. He went uh, to the, you know, he started timing the red lights and timing how long it takes to go through them. Figured out that when somebody's making a right or a left turn, they slow down a little bit, which, th you know, means that you don't go through the green, the, red, the yellow light. You don't quite finish the turn before the light turns red. Snap, guilty. He said, he, he presented his findings to the, uh, the Oregon uh, uh, agency uh, in charge of red light cameras and they didn't they didn't like somebody calling them on their bad math and their bad uh, model so he got uh, he got a he got a a, a, a fine five hundred dollars for the unlicensed practice of engineering john is that uh, a, a a good example of regulatory overkill well i think this goes back to what you were talking about earlier and it's the follow the money um these automatic cameras in, in uh, intersections, especially uh, busy intersections where you know, people cautiously slow down and make turns, um, are, are supposedly put there for safety, and in some areas they are, but they're a money machine for the municipalities where they're run. And instead of having a cop sitting there, they have these automated cameras, and they take a picture of somebody, and because it looks scientific, it feels scientific because there's a picture and there's the time, and yes, they are in the intersection. Um, it stands up in court, and the money just flows in, flows in. For in the state of California, I think it's what is it running a red light's like four hundred ninety-seven dollar fine or something like that. So it's follow the money. I don't think their objection was to his uh, um, unlicensed practice of engineering. That was reaching for the straw. Their, their, his, their objection was that somebody caught them in their little, their little fraud. Somebody uh, tried to monkey wrench the system. I think it was in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and this, you know, the, the law says that not only does the license plate have to be uh, captured on, uh, uh, on the camera, but also the identity of the driver. Mm. So a guy started dri you know, driving around in, in the zebra costumes and lion costumes and clown costumes and uh, they couldn't uh, figure out who he was. <laughs> <laughs> so they tried good, so they went after him for some sort of whatever, I'm not sure. One more topic before we run out of time here. This is, a, I, I think, a great example of hypocrisy. Uh, Bernie's wife, Jane Sanders, is under FBI investigation for fraudulently inflating the number of fundraising commitments and securing a loan for the now bankrupt Burlington College while she was a president there. Uh, does this call into question the whole Bernie method? Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, it's a really great example of um, you these things aren't real. They're just not real. These um, politicians are all fixed. Yeah. That's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. I'm the Libertarian Counterpoint. Channel 17, Sacramento, YouTube.